Thank you so very much. Good morning. Good morning. Well, what we're going to do now is to take our Bibles or our devices. We're going to be turning to Acts chapter 27. This is one of the most vivid descriptions of a sea voyage found in ancient history, and it's right there in your scriptures. It's an extraordinary thing. Uh, a book has written, been written about it, two to three hundred pages in length on just this one chapter, The Voyage and the Shipwreck of the Apostle Paul, written by James Smith, uh, a man skilled in nautical uh, work, sailor, and the likes. Personal experiences that uh, various family members and I have traveled this. And so we have been out on the Mediterranean, out in the Aegean, and have followed in the footsteps and the travels of the Apostle Paul. So we have experience with Caesarea, serious uh, experience with Crete, onwards towards Rome, and so on. So occasionally, going back into the cabin, we jot down notes on what was being presented to us during the midst of our, of our tour. And as we follow it in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, that will come out in these verses as we explore this in the weeks to come. So Acts chapter 27, hopefully now you have found your way there. I'd love to read, this is sort of like the entry point, the point of departure, first 12 verses of this 27th chapter. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy... They delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Andromidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, the next day, we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. In putting out the sea from there, we sailed under the lay of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. A metaphor of life itself sometimes, wouldn't you say and when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. And there, the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy, put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days, arrived with difficulty off Sinaitis. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lay of Crete off Simon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. And since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous because... Well, even the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid, no more, paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. We're going to explore these, moments, these verses together. We are about to head off from the shoreline of Israel, make our way into the Mediterranean, into the Aegean and the likes. And there's lessons to be learned on this voyage, and we'll learn them together as we go, as we look to our Lord now in prayer. 
Father, we're thanking you for the way in which you guide us and you direct us through the movements of life. And as we're going to note in the midst of these verses, the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, would continuously involve himself in what we might describe this morning as mid-course adjustments. They thought they were heading in one direction, and lo and behold, the winds kick in. They have to adjust, maneuver, work as a team. Sometimes the winds would increase, other times decrease. Continual adjustments needed, like life itself. We're not meant to be static people. This is a dynamic world. And so, Father, what we need to do is to take the dynamics of the Holy Spirit and apply it to the ever-changing realities of what we face day in, day out. Now, Father, you know the needs here this morning in these various services. For those watching now or will be watching online in days, weeks to come, perhaps telling friends to explore these verses together in this study. What we want to do in this study is to sense how you, the one who inspired the scriptures, speak truth into our life situation. For that one that comes either in person or watching online that is spiritually curious about things that matter most, but has not settled matters pertaining to trust in you as Lord and Savior. But they're continuously having to adjust, continuously involved in mid-course adjustments in life. And they're looking for something which is changeless <coughs> in the midst of all the changeables. Father, Show them that the one who describes himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ, one who was, is, will be, is their constant in the midst of life's variables. So, Father, I pray that you will speak to hearts, and those that don't know Christ as Lord and Savior will put faith and trust exclusively in him. And for those that know you, Keep us from falling into the delusion of static living. This is a dynamic world. And we need, Father, to continuously make the adjustments necessary to move forward. We want to make full-spectrum disciples of people. Multiplying, not merely making, multiplying disciples for Jesus Christ. So, Father... As we now chart our course in these verses, pray that in the moments to come you would warm these hearts, engage these minds, shape these wills. As again, our Father, we've come here this morning to see Jesus, Him only. I'm going to pray these things again now in Jesus' name. Amen. On a shelf in our living room is the journal of Christopher Columbus where he had jotted some various thoughts down pertaining to why he was doing what he was about to do and so on and so forth. And he had written a book called The Book of Prophecies in which he penned these words. I prayed to the most merciful Lord about my heart's great desire, and he gave me the spirit and the intelligence for the task, seafaring, where astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and skill in drafting spherical maps and placing correctly the cities, rivers, mountains, and ports. It was the Lord who put into my mind to sail from here to there, 
and the fact that the gospel must still be shared to so many lands in such a short time. This is what convinces me. And then he would reference a promise from the book of Isaiah. The Apostle Paul now, at this particular juncture in his life experience, is going to embrace the promise that God has given in his word with the providence that God reveals in this world. Providence. That carries with the idea not only that God is watching you, but that God is watching over you. And what we want to do this morning is wed together the idea of God's promise and God's providence, stay extraordinarily focused upon who God is, upon how God works, and see how we can link this to 2021 living. And so what I want to do with you, and we're standing now at the shoreline, you see, of of Caesarea, As you're standing at the shoreline, you're about to embark on this journey with the Apostle Paul, objective to be able to make our way, albeit with a whole host of mid-course adjustments to Rome, is to be able to draw out for us now a number of what I will call preparation points. What's necessary, you see, to be fully equipped to be able to make journeys such as these, what we will metaphorically describe as our life journey. Now the first comes out of verse one, on to verse two. And here you and I are gonna begin with this first preparation point, that as our sovereign God fulfills his, his promises. Let's begin now by being prepared for what I'm gonna describe this morning as the restricted liberties that he might allow. Because what I want us to understand at this point is that the Apostle Paul has been under Roman custody for over two years. He has been positioned in Caesarea awaiting a trial to take place within Rome. And now, having appealed to Caesar, his opportunity is about to take place. But so often in life, the opportunities that we have involve a series of mid-course adjustments to get from where we are to where we need to be. Now, the governor of Caesarea, you might remember, we're dealing with people such as Felix and Festus, governors, a host of governors. We go back to the Pontius Pilate of Jesus' life experience in his earthly ministry, have been exposed to the gospel And now Festus has rightly said to the king, he had every right, you see, and every opportunity. And now Agrippa is now saying the same to Festus. To be set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. It is not coincidence, it is not an accident, but rather an appointment that the apostle Paul was a Roman citizen that gave him the opportunity as a Roman citizen to appeal his case to the higher court in the Roman system. And so now it was decided, as you begin to read in verse 1, when it was decided we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort. His name was... Julius. What I want to start with in verse 1 is the fact that God in his sovereign purposes has allowed Paul to be a prisoner. Why? Had Paul not been a prisoner, he would have never had the opportunity to stand before Caesar. He would have never gone into the epicenter of political decision-making. But as a prisoner and as a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal. And so now the governmental officials had no other option but to allow for this appeal to take place. 
don't bemoan the restrictions you experience in life, the limitations you face in life, and then wonder, how can God even use me? I, I lack the freedom to be able to do all that I dreamed of doing. God chose Paul's imprisonment as the means of getting Paul to Caesar. That doesn't happen. Do you see the ironies here? Had he been free, he would have got, not have gotten to Caesar. But as a prisoner, he does. Apply it. What restrictions are you experiencing right now in your life? Restraints. Limitations. The if only I had the opportunity, I would, and then you fill in the blank. Have you ever considered that God is the God who is sovereign over the limitations and takes the limitations and turns them into opportunities? And so now the supposed restriction in reality is the point of release where he is able to make his way from Israel to Rome. That's your God. And so you're still in verse 1, and you and I are told they delivered Paul. Paul did not deliver himself. He's under custody. He's under restraint. They delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Now, if you had been watching Paul at this point, you would probably have been saying, prisoner, no hope, no future, but you see, Paul is living off of the promise of God that he would make his way to Rome. Over a hundred years ago, down the streets of a particular setting in England, <coughs> great naval poet, listen to this, walked a man who had only one arm, blind in one eye, could not walk upon the deck of a ship without getting seasick, yet he was a sailor. More than that, he was the foremost sailor in the world at that time. Horatio Nelson, Admiral Nelson, England's greatest admiral, author of this incredible phrase, quote, England expects every man to do his duty, unquote, when against odds he led his troops to victory in battle. The appearances of life might be such that you look at Paul at this point and say he's just a prisoner. God looks at Paul and says, as a prisoner, this is my means of getting my man to where I want him to be, the very epicenter of decision-making in the world, Rome. Don't underestimate how God will work through your own life circumstances even if they feel so incredibly restricted. Furthermore, what fascinates me is that with other prisoners, he is going to be attended to by this, by this centurion, whose name is Julius. If you were to explore the scriptures with me, you would spot about seven centurions in your Newer Testament all of which were exposed to the gospel in various ways, used by God in various ways, who stands out in your mind? Well, at the cross of Jesus Christ, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, the gospel writer Mark pens this, these words from him, truly this man was the son of God. Centurion. Furthermore, if you get into Acts chapter 10, where we've been in this two-year study, what you will find is that there was Peter giving opportunity to explain grace to this man in the midst of the Roman leadership within Israel. 
And now what we find is that God is making his way through the ranks and prepping ahead of time for when Paul appears on the scene, there's already sufficient awareness of the gospel through various means that God chooses to use. Struck with the fact that Rick Perry, former governor of Texas, is putting together a major movement to seek to share the gospel with various political leaders around the nation. He believes such a time as this has come. And he's at the forefront of this movement. God is sovereign. God works. And now in verse 2, embarking in a ship of Andromidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, and isn't this like God? He creates fellowship for Paul in the restrictions of life. There is Aristarchus, as well as the physician Luke, who writes this account. Notice the we. He's including Luke is himself here. Accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, and the locals call it Thessaloniki, and what we find is that because Paul has poured himself into this man, this man in turn now is going to minister to Paul. When you're involved in personal discipleship, bear in mind that this is not a one-way street. There is a flow as you give, you receive. As you give, you receive. Such is life. And so I think it's time now to take a good hard look at what Paul was experiencing. So notice this picture of Paul, and he's now embarking upon the ship. As he's making his way onto the ship, by all appearances, it would seem like it's, a, it's an Admiral Nelson moment. But there's more to this man, and there's more to his God than meets the eye at this particular point. God is making connections in the midst of life's restrictions. And he's doing that with you. When you see a restriction placed upon your life, I want you to consider the connections being made for your life. And so he gets on this ship, and well, we need a map to be able to find our way from A to B, don't we? And so as we look at this map, what we want to be able to do is to say at this point, here's Caesarea, you and I, are about to leave here and make our way up around this corridor. This will be modern-day Turkey up here until we get into the region that, uh, uh, where it's primarily Greek and Rhodes and so on, Sinaitis, until we're eventually today going to end up in Phoenix on Crete. And so what we see is that the Apostle Paul is being guided and directed by the sovereign God, and in the very same way, in the midst of your restrictions, God is making some very unique connections to achieve his purposes for his glory and for your, your good. You ready for a second preparation point? Flows out of verse 3 down through verse 8. As our sovereign God fulfills his promises, be prepared for not only the restricted liberties he might allow and in fact use from restrictions to connections, but second of all, the unexpected mercies he might provide the unexpected mercies he might provide. And I want you to see that they're coming from both believers and unbelievers at this point. For example, the next day we put in at Sidon, and here's the centurion, Julius. And Julius treated Paul kindly. Never underestimate how you respond to life and how you respond to God in the midst of the difficulties, the challenges, and the limitations of life. At this moment, this secular man, this centurion, Julius, is observing Paul and believes that he can trust Paul to the point where he will give Paul some liberties that the other prisoners would not be able to experience. To what degree? Julius treated him, Paul, verse 3, kindly, 
and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. Now, you've got to bear in mind, centurions are responsible for getting their prisoners from point A to point B. This is risk. But when one observes your character in the midst of the challenges, the difficulties, and the restrictions of life, and finds you trustworthy, you can take that sense of you being found trustworthy and use that as a means to talk about putting trust in your God which is what Paul is doing at this point. And now he's about to experience the richness of fellowship. The reaction of the unbelieving Greek writer, Lucian, observing about the relationships, the fellowship of of Christians, was penned in these words. It is incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that faith, Christianity, help each other in their needs and in their wants. They spare nothing for each other. Why, their first legislator, Jesus, has put into their heads that they are family, that they are brethren. Well, evidently now, what we see is that God is sovereignly working in both an unbeliever's mindset, Julius, the centurion, And the believers' hearts, where he is allowing them to be able to spend a little time ministering to Paul, God is now bringing together all of these dynamics so that Paul can have an impact and Paul can also experience the impact of God's grace. Julius treated Paul kindly, that's the unbeliever, gave him leave to go to his friends, the believers, and be cared for. They have paused at Sidon where Paul has previously given of the gospel ministry. You read on. And putting out to sea, we, so obviously Luke is part of this entire experience, putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lay of Cyprus. Cyprus. Now if you get to Cyprus, lower section, highly Greek, Upper section, highly Turk. Incredible tensions, historically and ethnically, um, embodied in that microcosmic of an island, Cyprus. There, there, under the lay of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when the winds are against us, metaphorically speaking, it's time for a mid-course adjustment in your life. Rather than giving up, you adjust, and you keep on keeping on. You doing that? In verse 5, you and I are told that we had sailed across to the, the open sea along the coast of Cilicia, Pamphylia, came to Myra in Lycia. You see the extraordinary detail that's found here. The book, The Voyage and Shipwreck of the Apostle Paul, chronicles this and is struck with the archaeological and historical and geographic accuracies being described here in these verses by a sailor who has set sail and observed these very ports and settings. Well, now, in verse 6, you and I are told that there, the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing at this point for, for Italy. Now, what we need to bear in mind is that Rome's grain fleet was dominated. It dominated the Mediterranean trade. And ships from Alexandria, Egypt, would travel northward and then westward, carrying cargo, grain, to Rome. It took roughly about 50 days, maybe about two months. Maybe we should show the grain ship right now, get a sense of what we're dealing with at this point, if it could appear on the screen. And what you and I would find is that 
down below is not only where the grain would be found, but furthermore, this is where those that were being held captive, going to their time in the, in the Colosseum, where they would put on gladiator performances, would be found. But as a Roman citizen, the Apostle Paul, with added freedom, would have opportunity to go up deck, up on the upper deck down to the lower deck and share the gospel of Jesus Christ to those whose lives, well, their days were numbered. So now what we find is that there is a growing opportunity for the gospel to be presented even prior to arriving in Rome at this juncture. Because Paul, yes, he's a prisoner, but he is a Roman citizen, you see given an opportunity to use that as a means of being able to move from point A to point B along that ship. So now, they had to get a different ship, another mid-course adjustment in this journey from Caesarea onwards to, onwards to Rome. So now, the physician picks it up for you and for me in verse 7, doesn't he, with another we, because this is this is eyewitness material. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Sinaitis. There's the wind. Challenges. Another adjustment. As the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lay of Crete off Simon. And coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens. Fair heavens, which was the city of Lycia. It's on the island of Crete. Maybe we've got a picture of, of fair havens where if you were traveling there, you would say to yourself, well, this isn't fair, and it's not much of a haven, to be honest with you. But uh, the Chamber of Commerce obviously wanted to uh, designate this otherwise so it would get a lot of trade coming their way. Well, if you begin to look at that, what you find is that here is the wearisomeness of people who've been on a ship and they're longing for the freedoms that could be found politically. But what we need to understand is that what people are longing for politically will ultimately be experienced eternally if they know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. From her beacon and glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, templest, toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. People are wearied by their life journeys. One salesman puts it this way. The fishermen know that the sea is dangerous. The storm's terrible. But they have never found these dangers sufficient reason for remaining ashore. There's adventure in living for Jesus. Step out. Step out. Don't let the shoreline hinder your movements, metaphorically speaking. We've noticed thus far in our preparation points the restricted liberties that God, he might allow in one through two and the unexpected mercies that he might provide where he combines the mercies flowing from the heart of a centurion with those of fellow believers. But now onward to a third preparation point. I want you to see thirdly, as you and I are exploring this together, that as our sovereign God fulfills his promises, be prepared thirdly for the threatening circumstances he might permit. Because you and I, if we are being honest with life and honest with ourselves, are going to go through times where life is extraordinarily threatening. We experience loss, loss of loved ones, 
incredible difficulties with life's circumstances. And now here it is for Paul. Since much time had passed, isn't that like life? And the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. A few thoughts. The fast here refers to Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, which means that that took place in September or October each year, which tells us, and now I'm reading from a, a nautical journal, sea travel became more dangerous as winter approached. Shipping was completely closed down from November 10th to as late as March 10th. But September 15th through November 10th and March 11th through May 26th were extraordinarily risky periods as well. So with that in mind, what you want to be able to spot at this point is this. They're out at sea. He is with people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in the Roman Empire, what do you do? Well, when life gets difficult out at sea, you begin sacrificing to the false gods in order to seek their protection. But God has sovereignly placed this one who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in the midst of people that are prone to sacrifice to their false gods, say, here's where true protection is found. Likewise, bring it home, 2021. You've gone through some challenging times in your life. You've experienced loss in your life. But God has his hand upon you and your family, your children, your loved ones. You've got a story to tell. In the midst of the voyage you're on. And people need to hear that story. They need to hear about your God. The God who looks out over you, not merely watches you, but watches over you in the midst of the risky ventures of life. So in verse 10 now, now he's not a sailor, but he's going to make an appeal now to the centurion. Sirs, I, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Yet he himself is holding on to the promise that he is going to make it to Rome. But he's burdened for the others on this ship. And so should you and so should I. You've got to find ways to communicate truth in the midst of the threats of life. And you do it, and you share it, because so many people feel threatened in the course of their days. A fourth and a final. That when you and I are exploring these ideas together, as our sovereign God fulfills his promises, be prepared now, fourthly, for the disregarded opinions he might employ. Paul is going to make a recommendation. His recommendation is going to be rejected. Ever had that happen at work? Ever had that happen in your life experience? You've got opinions. You've got experience. You've been around the block a few times. Or should we put it around the harbor a few times? But then a verse 11 kicks in. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend winter, the majority, evidently, they took a vote. Dangerous. The majority decided to put out to sea. And from there on the chance, and you smile at that point, because what's the chance that God's not sovereign? Not a chance. On the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, 
a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. So let's get our bearings, go back to our map, see where we were, see, see where we are, see where we got to be. Well, you look at this, and what you and I now find at this point, we started over here, and we've made our way up, hugged along the, along the shorelines of Turkey, but now we're making our way more into Greek territory, and there is Crete. Been there, walked that island to some degree. When you walk it, by the way, you got to have a Greek salad, just recommendation for you, because the soil, the volcanic soil there, creates a flavor second to none. Just want you to know when you're, when you're checking the menu. Well, onward from there until you get to the point where you're in Phoenix. Phoenix, that's the harbor that they are going to spend the remaining time in before they will venture forth. And when you look at that and you explore these four preparation points, ponder the words of Ernest Shackleton, during his expedition to cross the Antarctic, captured in that great film, Endurance. A writer puts it this way, in December of 1914, Shackleton and his 27-member crew aboard the ship Endurance entered the ice fields of Waddell Sea, navigating through dangerous pack ice. With only 100 miles left in the journey, Shackleton made the fateful decision to stop, wait for a break in the ice. But the temperatures dropped, the ice closed in around the ship, making it impossible to proceed. The crew would have to live aboard the ship for the next 10 months. So Shackleton and said it's time to abandon ship, and so the crew began a march in search of safety making their way to the deserted Elephant Island. Stranded on the island, supposedly no hope of rescue, Shackleton and four other crew members set sail on a lifeboat in an effort to reach the island of South Georgia. Traveling 800 miles through the worst of seas, they made their way. Shackleton and two of his men must cross on foot Cliffs of ice, vulnerable, blizzards, winds. It looked impossible, but they crossed in 36 hours. Reading from his diary, an interesting perspective on the crossing. Quote, I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that there were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions, but afterward, Mr. Worsley said to me, Boss, I had a curious feeling that there was another person with us. And Shackleton pointed upward and said, Yes, God is with us. And God is with you on your journey. be continued. Let's stand together. We can learn a lot from life experiences, but what's extraordinarily valuable is when we apply your word to life experiences. Here we have case in point of a man being led by you who had to nonetheless make a series of decisions involving mid-course adjustments to get from where he was to where he needed to be. For anyone this morning who's making a series of decisions based upon issues of the past or present, a series of losses, a series of disappointments perhaps, 
highs and lows all woven into the story of their lives. And might be tired this morning and wondering how do I make another adjustment? Fill them with grace. Remind them of Paul. He made it to Rome. And they're going to get to where they need to be by your grace as well. I commit each one viewing online and each one in these services this morning now into your care and ask that your blessing be upon one and all. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.